And thank you, participants, and thank you, organizers and sponsors, for what has been a most interesting and congenial conference. And I'm sure the rest of it will be, too. I'm not a Stegner scholar of any kind. I'm not a scholar of any kind. I am a deadbeat poet and writer from Oregon <laughs> who had the luck of knowing Wallace and Mary Stegner in a domestic way during the last 10 years of Wally's life. In this talk, which is a shorter form uh, of an essay in the new book that um, Bob mentioned, I'll give a brief portrait of the Wallace Stegner I knew, and I'll explore what I consider a key element of his character. As will happen in a conference, uh, this talk will stray into some of the territory Richard White covered in his most thoughtful presentation yesterday, and to a lesser degree into the area of Melody's sharp and spirited talk earlier today. I would apologize for not writing something fresh for this gathering, were it not for the friend and mentor who advised me to get good mileage in print, in voice, out of every piece I write. Publish it three or four times, he said. <laughs> Get paid each time. Break it up and use the parts in other works. J.S. Bach did it. <laughs> that friend and mentor was Wallace Earl Stegner. Wallace Stegner's hunger for wholeness. I'm sorry, and I, I changed my, my title from um, the one that Bob gave you. That was my, my doing, not his. One night years ago, as I was rereading some of the essays in The Sound of Mountain Water, I heard myself say to my wife, Wallace Stegner is one of the wholest American writers. Marilyn did not reply, as it was two in the morning and she was asleep. <laughs> I took her rapt silence as affirmation and decided <laughs> and decided I would try to track down what my remark might mean. I can't think of another writer who distinguished himself or herself in so many genres and fields of prose, novel, short story, personal essay, memoir, history, biography, nature writing, travel writing, literary journalism. Only poetry, it seems, eluded Stegner's pen. He did like verse, and when I was around him, he frequently quoted lines from Milton, Wordsworth, or his friend Robert Frost, some of which he had carried in memory all the way from his early schooling in the 1910s and 20s. He liked Robinson Jeffers and some contemporary poetry, especially that of Wendell Berry and William Stafford. Once, giddy from having my first essay accepted by Wilderness Magazine, I told Stegner that I might quit writing poems altogether, don't you dare, he said. It was the poets who led us out of the caves. <laughs> Imagine my pleasure then when I discovered that Stegner had scribbled a verse or two after all. One day in the 1980s at Stanford University, when I should have been reading student papers, I wandered instead into an unoccupied neighboring office and browsed through a few dusty books. Opening a little volume titled Historia de España, copyright 1923, I was shocked to find on the flyleaf the signature of Wallace Stegner, along with Español 5 and Universidad de Utah. <laughs> I leafed ahead and found page after page of penciled Stegner artwork labeled futuristic by the artist, and various marginalia, including two short poems. One of them was a biblical couplet. Yea, verily I say unto you, how's your old lady? <laughs> in, the, in, that second, um, in that second line, he has is, he is knowledgeably added the up upside down question mark that goes at the beginning of sentences in Spanish. <laughs> The other delivers itself in five snappy lines. Socrates, apple crates, insurance rates, pair of eights, soul mates. Unambitious, perhaps, but not the dullest poetry of the early 20th century. 
I can't resist mentioning that on another page, I caught young Stegner practicing the S in his last name, shaping it something like the G clef and something like a dollar sign. He sensed, perhaps, that in the life ahead, he might need to be signing his name a lot. I also found three pairs of seeming nonsense words that suddenly came clear as female names written backwards. Whatever Grace Anderson, Nola Cook, and Carol Barclay saw in Stegner, it seems likely that Stegner saw poetry in them. But the wholeness of Wallace Stegner I value most is not a matter of poetry, and not merely a matter of his versatility. It has to do with what he put into his prose and what he put into himself in the course of his 84 years. Marilyn and I had the good fortune to live on the Stegner home place in Los Altos Hills, California, for five years in the 1980s while I was teaching undergraduate poetry workshops and freshman English at Stanford. We rented a small redwood-sided cottage that had been Stegner's writing studio in the 1950s. And we worked off the rent doing various chores of gardening and maintenance around the small acreage of grass, native oaks, hedges, and flower beds. In this way, we came to know Wallace and Mary Stegner pretty well. In the course of a week, I usually worked several afternoon hours with Wally, who had quit teaching more than a decade earlier. He spent his forenoons writing. He created Crossing to Safety, his last novel in those years. And after lunch and a brief nap, he was ready to get after whatever needed doing outdoors. He was tall, silver-haired, and usually smiling. And in his smile, the lines of his age all participating, you could, saw, you could see the boy he had been on the Saskatchewan Plains, in Salt Lake City, and elsewhere in the North American West. Marilyn and other female acquaintances as well found very fetching a certain sly sparkle in his eyes. So he stands out among older men, I asked her once, ever curious to know what women find attractive. <laughs> no, she replied, he stands out among men. <laughs> <laughs> While he relished his work, he moved from task to task around the place, weeding, pruning, spading, painting a downspout, trapping the insufferable gophers, Terry, I'm afraid he never quite kicked the habit. <laughs> In a kind of loping shuffle, torso tilted forward, feet keeping close to the ground, it was eager and careful at the same time. Mary didn't much like it. Wally, I heard her tell him once, you shuffle along as if you were late for a train. Why can't you walk more like John? <laughs> I proceeded in silence with my errand of the moment, suddenly delighted with the dignity of my gait. <laughs> Grateful that there was at least one walk of life in which I might serve as a model for Wallace Stegner. <laughs> he got a lot done in an afternoon, shuffling in that deliberate hurry from orchids to carport to pool to woodpile. And at something like the same pace, he got a lot done in his lifetime, too, shuttling around the West as a boy, awakening in his teens and moving on through schools and teaching jobs to the work of writing, his index fingers punching the keys of his Olympia manual typewriter every day from sunup to noon. From sentence to sentence and page to page, he turned out more than 30 books by the time he was done. Wallace Stegner had an ego. He enjoyed the attention he came to receive the praise for his writing and teaching and environmentalism, the major honors and prizes, but it wasn't those that kept him punching the keys. He relished his work. Even as he was pushing 80, nothing left to prove. Every morning, he was hungry to pick up the typescript pages on the desk in his study and add a few more. His hunger started young. Wolf Willow, is an account of return and remembering, a midlife putting together of the place and culture Wallace Stegner came from. The first few pages of the book are mostly history. He shows us the past he didn't come from, the gun-toting culture of horse opera movies, and the immense plains landscape that did indeed begin to form his soul and character. <laughs> 
The present time narrative of his return to that country as a man in his 40s begins unobtrusively. Not until page six does the narrator poke the car tentatively eastward from Medicine Hat, easing watchfully back into the past. As he homes in on the town of White Mud, the house and play haunts of his childhood, he sizes memory against present perception, and the personal narrative expands. He is literally remembering, piecing together his past, trying to make it whole in his present mind. The process culminates not as he views the house his father built or the businesses on Main, Main Street, but when he identifies a pervasive smell that captures him beside the White Mud River. It is wolf willow, a native riparian bush. Stegner realizes his past by exercising our oldest sense. For a few minutes, with a handful of leaves to my nose, I look across at the clay bank and the hills beyond where the river loops back on itself, enclosing the old sports and picnic ground, and the present and all the years between are shed like a boy's clothes dumped on the bathhouse bench. A contact has been made. A hunger is satisfied. The sensuous little savage that I once was is still intact inside me. For many writers in this age of memoir, amplifications of this realization would have constituted the bulk and thrust of the story. I have returned, I have remembered who I was, and now I know better who I am. But for Wallace Stegner, the merely personal was not sufficient. This epiphany comes in chapter one, the first of 19, plus an epilogue. The next two chapters amplify the personal story, but in the following nine, he progresses to the larger weave in which his family's life was only one thread. He gives the history of the town and region, the history that he did not receive as a child because it had not been recorded or thought important and because the white settlement phase of it was only beginning in 1914 when his family arrived. The middle-aged writer is annoyed over what he missed as a boy. And through the middle of Wolf Willow, his resentment rings like a litany in sentences such as these. The very richness of that past as I discover it now makes me irritable to have been cheated of it then. All of it was legitimately mine. I walked that earth, but none of it was known to me. I wish we had known it. I wish we had heard of the coming of the Sioux when they rode northward after annihilating Custer's five troops on the Little Bighorn, a whole nation moving north, driving the buffalo before them, and with the soldiers from every army post between Canada and Texas on their track. I knew the swallows and muskrats and was at ease with them, but time which man invented I did not know. I was an unpeopled and unhistoried wilderness, I possessed hardly any of the associations with which human tradition defines and enriches itself. In an interview recorded in 1987, Stegner likened the absence of those associations to a deficiency disease, a condition that can stunt the human mind and spirit as surely as malnutrition stunts the body. But he refused to be stunted. Deprived of wholeness as a child, he followed his hungers and healed himself in a singular and prodigious way. He made himself into the Herodotus of the Cypress Hills, unearthing and imagining and writing the very history he had wanted as a boy. Stegner said, characteristically, that the main task of Wolf Willow was history. Autobiogra autobiography and fiction were adjuncts to the historical account. I would put it a different way. I see the book as initiated, powered, and shaped by the needs of knowledge seeking its wholeness. Personal memory comes more or less to completion in the first three chapters. But personal memory, as the author remarks several times in the book, and as any writer of memoir knows, is uneven and unreliable, and even in its wholeness is insufficient. And so he augments personal memory with the collective memory of history, but even that larger memory is limited and insufficient, insufficient at least to a writer of Wallace Stegner's hunger. He ends the book with the epic novella Genesis and its sequel story Carrion Spring, extending his act of memory beyond the horizon of personal and historical fact into the further realization of fictional creation, 
And a book that would have been ample as a memoir in history becomes something more, the very most its author could make it, a full immersion baptism in the times and landscape that made him one of the great acts of knowing in the American literature of place. I thought I could get more truth into a slightly fictionized story of the winter that killed the cattle industry on the northern plains than I could into any summary, Stegner remarked in his essay on the writing of history. He was right. Without Genesis, a reader of Wolf Willow would know about the harsh climate of the Canadian plains. With it, he knows that brutal cold in his bones and blood. With Carrion Spring, he knows from a woman's perspective the isolated home imprisonment, uh, imprisonment of that same awful winter. Both stories are fundamentally about cooperation. A band of buckaroos on Roundup suddenly must work together to survive an epic blizzard. A newly wedded husband and wife struggle to settle their claims on place, culture, and each other. Both reflect another form of wholeness Wallace Stegner hungered for, the wholeness of community. Acts of individual heroism did not interest him as much as acts of individuals working and neighboring and loving together. That was the wholeness he wished for his mother, who had the character and skills to be a sticker, a community builder, but was married to a man who did not. How hungry you were, Stegner addresses her in letter much too late. How you would have responded to the opportunities ignored by so many who have them. And in these words, of course, his own hunger as a boy is spoken, the hunger he remembers in Wolf Willow as giving him a bolt of joy at the sight of town, looped in its green coils of river, snug and protected in its sanctuary valley, when the family trekked back from their dryland wheat farm in the fall. Town was school and games and friendship, the post office, travelers from afar. During summers on the homestead, 320 acres of wind and grass, bounded by one iron post and three survey stakes. The boy's hunger for human association could express itself only in a passionate regard for the footpaths the family walked into the prairie in their daily living. In the last chapter of Wolf, Willows, Wolf Willow, titled The Making of Paths, Stegner tells of his frustration when other members of the family cut across to the privy from the wrong corner of the house, <laughs> ignoring the proper trail. I scuffed and kicked at clods in persistent grass clumps, he writes, and twisted my weight on incipient weeds and flowers, willing that the trail around the inside of our pasture should be beaten dusty and plain, a worn border to our inheritance. When three summers of drought did in his father's farming fantasy and set the family on its erratic way again, the 11-year-old Stegner took with him hungers of incompleteness that would drive him through a mighty career. But he left with one kind of completeness already realized. In six formative years, he had come to know intimately the land and life and weather of the plains. He knew the pushing and shouldering wind, a thing you tighten into as a trout tightens into fast water, a grassy, clean, exciting wind with a smell of distance in it and in its search for whatever it is looking for, it turns over every wheat blade and head, every pale primrose, even the ground-hugging grass. He knew the circling horizon, always miles away, and he knew the immense sky, alive with navies of cumuli, fair weather clouds, their bottoms as even as if they had scraped themselves flat against the flat earth. In that 87 interview, Stegner said he could draw pictures of plains wildflowers he hadn't seen since he was 10. He knew the particulars of that country, and he knew its changefulness, the way tornadic storms could boil up in a blue-black sky. But he also knew, beyond its things and motions, the country's elemental permanence, disk of earth, bowl of sky, exact circle of horizon, segmented lines of fence and roadway. A country of geometry, he calls it in Wolf Willow, a Euclidean perfection. It is the paradox of that landscape to be simultaneously empty and archetypally whole, and human presence there is paradoxical as well. A person is on the one hand tiny, 
but on the other, as sudden as an exclamation mark, as enigmatic as a question mark. At noon, the total sun pours on your single head. At sunrise or sunset, you throw a shadow a hundred yards long. Stegner argued in his essay, Ansel Adams and the Search for Perfection, that the Sierra Nevada, especially Yosemite, had taught Adams how to see and made him the photographer he was. It may be as reasonable to argue that the Northern Plains taught Wallace Stegner how to see and made him the writer that he was. Surely a writer under the influence of that empty but entire landscape is likely to look outward, beyond himself, for his completeness. Such a writer is likely to know the singularity of particular things and creatures lit by a sun that shines in summer from four o'clock in the morning until nine at night. He will be interested in community, a student of how people get by together, but he will also be self-sufficient. He is likely to carry with him a sense of possibility as immense as the land around him. And he may want to make a mark, a question mark, an exclamation mark, a mark perhaps like the pathways that fired his young mind. It may be a seemly mark, but not a small one. An artist whose mind comes to light in that expansive space will be no miniaturist. I may not know who I am, Stegner wrote in Wolf Willow, but I know where I am from. That well-known comment is misleading. Wallace Stegner knew very well who he was. He knew himself better than anyone else in my experience. And yes, he knew who he was in considerable part because he knew where he was from, including its beauties and powers as well as its strict limits. In one of his last essays, he writes, there is something about exposure to that big country that not only tells an individual how small he is, but steadily tells him who he is. I have never, I have never understood identity problems. And he goes on to write, I knew well enough who or what I was, even if I didn't matter. As surely as any pullet in the yard, I was a target, and I had better respect what had me in its sights. A target. The pullet in the yard had been the target of a ferruginous hawk dropping out of an empty sky just a few yards from young Stegner, an event he witnessed several times. But what in that immensity had him in its sights? In its sights? His sense of vulnerability may have had to do with being a sickly child whose mind was two years ahead of his body in school and who grew up, in the adult writer's words, hating my weakness and cowardice. It surely had to do with being the son of an angry father who once broke the boy's collarbone with a stick of firewood. Waiting out a cyclone lashed to a survey stake in a one-foot hole in the prairie may have contributed as well. But in the 1987 interview, he put the sense of being a target in a different light. He spoke of the uncanny doubleness one feels beneath that enormous sky, a sense of observing everything else the way God may be observing you. Wallace Stegner didn't refer to God very often. I don't know what God meant to him. But I suspect that the sense of being transcendently observed would come easily in the Plains country, and with it a sense of being inevitably known, of being a question mark, unable to hide. And I suspect that such an awareness contributed considerably to the healthy hunger of Stegner's 84 years. A targeted man, a man in the sights of a power he respects and fears and loves, is likely to work as hard and as well and as long as he can. Talking once with a group of Greek writers about having grown up without history, Stegner was surprised to hear from some of the Greeks that they envied him. Their rich and lengthy past felt like no blessing, they said, in the diminished present of their culture. But I envied them more than they envied me, Stegner wrote, for what they had was what I had spent my life hopelessly trying to acquire. A targeted man might see his life that way, I suppose, but the statement is hopelessly inaccurate. Stegner did indeed grow up, as he puts it in Wolf Willow, in a dung-heeled sagebrush town on the disappearing edge of nowhere, 
utterly without painting, without sculpture, without architecture, almost without music or theater, without conversation or languages or bookstores, almost without books. He was indeed charged with getting in a single lifetime from scratch what some people inherit as naturally as they breathe air. But get it, he did. There was nothing hopeless or halfway about the lifelong acquisition of wholeness he embarked upon once his hunger took hold of him. In his senior year of high school, he shot up six inches, finding himself suddenly as big as his classmates. And in his inner life, his inner life, the, his cultivation of himself, you get the feeling he took off at the same rate and scarcely slowed. Hunger is a powerful need, and it can be a powerful asset. Ask any writer, any artist, if he does his best work after a big meal or before. Ask any mountain lion. And so it may be a mixed blessing that the situation of most American authors coming of age in the early 21st century vary sharply from Stegner's in the early 20th. There are and always will be exceptions, but by and large, writers today come up well-schooled, richly provided with books and museums and performance halls, hundreds of college creative writing programs waiting to nurture and unfold their talents and eventually perhaps to employ them which is the real purpose of those programs. <laughs> Sad to say. <laughs> and what has this meant for our literature? It's burgeoning, certainly. A great plenty is being written and published. And as always, some of that plenty is good. I have to wonder, though, if contemporary, contemporary literature isn't suffering in some ways from a lack of hunger in its authors. Where is the ambition, for instance, to be knowledgeable of history, geography, the sciences, and other fields beyond the increasingly specialized craft and criticism of creative writing? Where is the desire to write well in several genres? Where is the awareness of tradition, of one's place in what Stegner called the great community of recorded human experience? Where, to cite a different kind of wholeness, where outside the field of nature writing per se, is the American landscape and its creatures? And where is the writing that seeks its wholeness outward, recognizing that personal rapture or torment are insufficient material for the making of literature? It was Wallace Steger's project to understand himself in the context of his world. Increasingly, it seems, it is the project of contemporary writing to understand the world or fail to understand it in the context of the self. No doubt I am exaggerating to make a point. Today's literature is by no means entirely self-referential or self-enclosed. And I certainly don't wish to glorify cultural deprivation and repackage the destructive myth that art, in order to be authentic, must be the product of hardship. Talent finds its way, whether born with a silver pen in its hand or with dung on its heels, and our time has its share of talent. The talent, even genius, does not make a writer. Neither does the capacity to emote. Literature must be more than self-expression. If a writer has only himself to say, Stegner remarked and wrote more than once, his work will be kind of thin, a sentence that every writer of memoir should tape to the wall above his or her desk. That is an old-fashioned idea and it came from an old-fashioned man. I really don't belong in the 20th century, Stegner said in conversation with Richard Etchulain. My, depends, my de demands upon life are 19th century demands. Elsewhere, he worried that the principles of restraint, proportion, and a wide representation of all kinds of life, the principles I have tried to live and write by, have all been overtaken and overwhelmed. His concern, if a little histrionic, has greater justification now than when he first expressed it in the 1970s. As book publishing in America becomes a subsidiary of corporate entertainment conglomerates, the sensationalism of sex and violence that dominates film, television, and video games increasingly drives the book market as well. Many publishers have abdicated their traditional sense of responsibility to the culture, 
paying huge advances, advances for loud, flashy, and often poorly written novels, and for mediocre nonfiction by or about celebrities. Many of the better books that do get published are kept in print, if at all, through the life support of small batch print on demand. And yet, for all that, a book as quiet and quirky as Wolf Willow is in print today and has hardly been out of print in the half century since its initial publication. Crossing to Safety, Stegner's late novel on the unsensational subject of friendship, another kind of wholeness he favored, along with marriage for the long term, sold 35,000 hardback copies and countless paperbacks since it appeared in 1987. Fifteen years after his death, most of the major books Wallace Stegner wrote are now in print in one edition or another. When I see him in my mind these days, he's smiling, maybe not only with self-satisfaction. Maybe his own late life and posthumous success would convince even him that there remains a considerable audience for old-fashioned books that bring into focus what is worthy and enduring in our human experience of the given world. The holist writers are those with a complex sense of responsibility to history, community, nature, and culture, to values that transcend their private epiphanies and miseries, to whatever it is that holds them in its sights and demands the most of them. Wallace Stegner was that kind of writer. For 60 years, every morning till noon, he extended a carefully considered pathway out of the 19th century through the broad terrain of modern American life. That path, inconspicuous but clearly defined, democratic but always demanding, is one of the routes most likely to lead us to a future we want to inhabit. Thanks. Sir, sure. could you speak about uh, some of your uh, uh, couple of minutes about your personal uh, experience as a, uh, as a result of living uh, on the Stegner Place for five years? Sure. I'm a writer, so I'll just I'll read a little. This is only about a page, page and a half. This is uh, from another essay. Um, this is the one that's called The Cultivated Wild of Wallace Stegner. It's this, uh, in this very fine anthology that Mary and Paige put together, The Geography of Hope. Uh, this incident occurred very early on in, uh, my, in, in our tenure uh, in the cottage. The cottage had once been writing, Wally's writing study. A floor-to-ceiling living room window looked out on the foliage and smooth gray limbs of live oaks. The same oaks it pleased me to think that the author of Wilderness Letter might have looked, out, looked upon some two decades before. A hundred yard trail led from the cottage to our parking area, passing just below the Stegner's deck and Wally's new study. Marilyn and I became accustomed to hearing the steady tap of his Olympia manual typewriter as we, wa as we walked the trail in the morning. That was his call, and it began as early in the day almost as the birds began theirs. Once in a while, a whiff of cigar smoke hung in the air, blending with the scent of bay laurels. The tall, silver-haired man we began to know was considerate and friendly from the start, but his dignified reticence and my own awed reticence made conversation sparse for a while. I feared that anything of substance I tried to say would betray my considerable dearth of learning, and to make small talk with such a man, unless he began it, seemed disrespectful. Then one morning he put me at ease in a way he couldn't have intended. Walking the trail below his study, I noticed the typewriter was silent. A different noise, a rain-like patter, made me look up. And there was the eminent author, relieving himself over the rail of his deck. <laughs> it was one of the few times I ever saw him disconcerted. But even then, with a little fumbling, he wasn't much bothered. Welcome to the country, he said with a grin. We're not very formal. <laughs> Something um, 
something about um, the quality of Wally's prose. Once I made a turn, of, I sort of veered from poetry into prose at Stanford. Um, I was writing personal essays, and I took two, two American writers to be my style masters, uh, Henry David Thoreau and Wallace Stegner. Years later, when I found the will and discipline to become a writer, his phrases mixed with others in the compost of my reading to give me something else, the beginnings of a style. I liked the way he sounded on the page. I liked the dignity, the authority, the sense he gives of having significant things to say and the patience and wherewithal to get them said. The style is formal, but lively with colloquial energy, too. It has a high informality. It is personal without being confessional. It points itself to the worthy and enduring things of this world, those of the human realm and those of nature, and values those above its own powers and considerable virtuosity. Let's see what else happened. It was a pleasure um, to be pruning trees on the place. Uh, at Wally and Mary's direction, uh, they on the ground, me sitting up in the pistachio tree or whatever it was, there were several, uh, with a small chainsaw, just waiting for them to figure out which limb was next. And, <laughs> and they would argue about it. <laughs> and they would have different memories about when the tree had been planted. They were on that place for, uh, you know, almost 50 years for Wally and uh, longer than 50 years for Mary. And I just thought to myself, well, you know, that would be, that would be, that would be great. I hope, I hope I'm, I hope me and Marilyn are in that situation some far off day uh, when we can have friendly arguments about the history of the of a place where we put in some time. Once I was digging a, a trench for an illegal um, septic line, <laughs> Wally and Mary were they they added a um, they added a bathroom to his, to his sites, to his study, office study. Uh, <laughs> and you don't, yeah, I'm, so he didn't have to, you know. <laughs> I think they anticipated in, in, in thinking of old age when maybe they would have a, a helper, they would turn the study to a helper's quarters and, and he or she would need, you know, facilities. Anyway, he didn't want to get a permit, can't blame him for that, I mean, it's too expensive. <laughs> So I was digging, um, digging a line down from the corner of the, of the study down um, to where the septic tank either was or, or was to go. The new one, had, uh, I guess it had been installed. And I ran into a midden of various, um, you know, a lot of liquor bottles and rusted cans and, you know, this and that and a couple of old license plates, plates but mainly liquor bottles. And I call, and I, you know, this is archaeological find. I call Wally over and say, hey, look at this. What do you make of this? And he looked at it and said, well, I'm kids. You know, before we bought the property, they, they had their parties up here on this hill. It was well known, you know. So he, he went back to what he was doing. And I picked up one of the license plates. <laughs> and it was, you know, no stickers those days. But it, the date of the year of its, its issue was stamped into the plate. And it was 1950, which was well into the Stenier tenure, was the Stenier tenure on that on that hill. So I did not point this out to Wally. <laughs> but that night, Marilyn and I drank a bottle of Burgundy, and, and I threw the empty and <laughs> threw the empty out into the field. And, and again, I thought, you know. We, we can't stay here forever. Some, we're going to live somewhere. And I hope we live there a long time, long enough to lay down some archaeology and to interpret it to some kid who comes along <laughs> and digs it up. <laughs> Sir. Okay. Well, I was just wondering, you know, like, uh, about ashes being scattered under these trees in Vermont, all of this despair, uh, darkness. And I was just wondering if you agree that Mr. Fracking's point of view, it's too bad he couldn't be here to feel part of this question, but I mean, 
you seem to have known Mr. Stegner there towards the end of his life. Is, is it your opinion then that... You're doing a bad job of being my shill. Because you're, <laughs> it's too obvious. But, but, so I'll just go ahead and answer. You don't have to finish the question. And I'm sorry that Phil had to, had to dish out early because, um, first of all, I, I like his book very much. It's, it's a very welcome, welcome uh, um, successor to, to Jackson Benson. It's a better book, I think. Certainly gives a wholer, wholer sense of the man um, and, and including his, his dark spots, his warts, um, all that they may have been. It's a good book. The only, the only significant trouble I, had with, I have with it is his conclusion that Wallace Stegner Late in life, was given to dark moods of despair about the future of the American West, and um, and to quote Phil, um, he gave up on the West. <clears throat> now, I did not know obviously the whole Stegner. I am sure he was capable of considerable darkness. I thought several times how lucky I was to be Wally's friend, and how that was would be a, a, a much easier role than to have been his son. That said, um, I didn't see it. I didn't hear in conversation, I didn't hear despair about the American West. Um, I certainly didn't, nothing of what I knew of that man from 1983 to 1984, we, we weren't living there the whole time, but we moved to Oregon and we were, we were so we visited. Uh, nothing I knew of the man or of what he wrote during that time seems to point in the direction of despair about and or giving up on the West. Did he have, you know, moments of despair about the West? Surely. Was he satisfied with the present evolution of the American West? Of course not. Nobody, nobody who loves the West can be satisfied with the present evolution of the American West. And I won't do a whole litany, but um, the scars of exploitation are everywhere, extractive activity, and the ex activity itself is chugging along in many places. The junky little ramble shack towns with machinery strewn around and rubbish stuck in the barbed wire fence. The ubiquitous young men of the West with more beer in their bellies, it seems, than brains in their head. The dialogue, sometimes very heated, sometimes combative, going on all around the West, certainly, the, certainly in the Northwest, between people who have been in place for sometimes three or four generations, associated with extractive resource activities, and the people who come along later, like, like me and, and many others, um, who take exception to the extractive activities while continuing to depend on the products <laughs> those activities produce. Um, that's, that's something that's going to be bubbling for a long time. You know, there's a lot wrong. There's a lot wrong with the West. Um, I think Wally felt about the West the way, um, I think his name is Samuel Huntington, another writer, the way he, he, he said he felt about America. He, Huntington was confronted by someone who said America is a lie, it's a failure. And Huntington said, America is not a lie. America is not a failure. It's a disappointment, which means it is also a hope. And this is the native home of hope. And the sign says stop. Thank you very much.